So, uh, like the previous speaker, I, on my way over here, I was wondering why you'd have me uh, speak on ADHD, since I am more the poster child for ADD than probably Dr. Howell is. Uh, but I actually did like the, uh, the sort of concept of now or not now. It's very much uh, reflects how a lot of us with ADD actually think and experience the world. Um, I'm going to actually take a different tact than Dr. Howell in terms of discussing attention deficit disorder, um, but his points are so critically important to remember. I've never heard a lecture uh, from a person as skilled as a clinician that has given real genuine pearls about understanding how to discuss ADD with patients and their families, uh, why medication is not, is not an inherently evil thing. Uh, how it can be used properly. Uh, just, it was just a fantastic lecture, so I don't know where he went, but that was a good job. My, my tack for this lecture is going to be more about the biology of the brain. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist and neurologist, so I spend my time thinking about you know, brain chemistry uh, and how it relates to ADD and other psychiatric diseases. So with that in mind, uh, the first thing to think about when we talk about attention deficit disorder is what is the, what is the biochemistry? What is the uh, the principal neurotransmitter pathways that have an effect uh, in this condition. And the primary neurotransmitter, because it's not a single magic bullet uh, uh, chemical in the brain, is something called dopamine. How many of you in the room actually have heard that word dopamine before? So you all have, uh, which is good. But I think people, including physicians, don't really understand what dopamine does in the brain. So part of this lecture will be to discuss with you how dopamine is a ubiquitous brain chemical that affects uh, essentially our pleasure centers in the brain. Uh, it's one of the major areas that, that uh, dopamine has an effect on. So things like sexual behavior or libido are influenced by dopamine levels. Uh, our attention, which obviously is coupled to our, our libido, right? We pay attention to things that you know, we're attracted to physically. Think about you know, how you behaved on your first date with your with your spouse compared to how you behave now. That's because your dopamine levels were higher. I mean, it's just the bottom line. And we also know that addiction is, is a dopaminergic-based condition. Work from a Nora Volkow, V-O-L-K-O-W at NIH, uh, has shown that dopamine deficiency disorders uh, are associated with addiction. So we see a lot of, I will use the word comorbidity. I know that, that, that Dr. Howell doesn't like that word, but in terms of comorbidity for ADHD, uh, we see very commonly substance abuse uh, going hand in hand with people with this diagnosis for the very reason that they're using drugs of abuse to uh, address their biologically based dopamine deficiency. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about uh, you know this in more detail. Now, in terms of prevalence of ADHD, uh, I'm a big believer that. Uh, that when we think of this disorder, it's a spectrum, right? So, there, and there's no clear demarcation of where a person becomes diseased versus having just attentional problems. We, as a society, have attentional disorder. I mean, there is zero doubt in my mind that we are suffering from collective attention deficit disorder in probably the grossest way imaginable uh, in terms of how we focus on things going on in our society today. Uh, but in terms of our, each individual person with ADD, we're all on that spectrum, right, to a certain degree or not. And the question is, how do we define what's medical and what's just, you know, character, just basic character? Um, I don't take medications for ADD. Um, you know, everyone that lives with me and works with me says that you definitely need medication. <laughs> just, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's pre I'm pretty pathological. I mean, I lose things all the time, all the time. Constantly, every day I lose something. And they're valuable things. Like I left my laptop in Boston last week. It's not like trivial things that I lose. And that laptop is my, is my second brain. Uh, but my point is that I think we define ADD as a medical condition when we are understanding that it is uh, creating dysfunction. And, the, and we have to ask that question, are these realms of your life becoming dysfunctional as a result of your attentional problems. So for instance, do you have substance abuse problems? Okay, if a person says yes, that would be a sign that they medically need to replace their substances, drugs of abuse, with prescription medication under the care of a physician or, or nurse practitioner 
that can actually safely administer the same medications that they're taking illicitly to the person's question I asked before the break. Um, so ask about domains of, of effect uh, in your patient. Uh, ask about their relationships. Are their relationships affected by, by ADD? Uh, uh, people with ADD are more accident prone. They're more likely to get speeding tickets. I got pulled over twice in the last three days. And I, it's amazing, I talked my way out of both tickets. It's unbelievable, I don't, I don't know how I did it. One was actually a, a patient, so the guy's this like mean big guy, sheriff pulls me, I was on the way here. And um, he, you know, was, he goes, did you not notice that you were doing 100 miles an hour when you passed me? I said, 100? <laughs> I said, it was more like 80. He goes, where the hell are you trying to go so fast? I go, to the airport. And he goes, why are you going to the airport? And I was like, I, it's all of a sudden the phone rings. And I go, sorry, I'm a doctor. Can I take this call? It was from a patient. She's like, Dr. Lombard, my kid's freaking out. You know? And he hears this whole thing. He goes, all right, you know, you're, you're legitimate. Go, go away. Don't crash into any trees. I'm like, but, but I probably would have if I hadn't gotten pulled over. And, and it's so distraction, you know, operating cars. We know that, that car accidents are significantly uh, greater risk in people with ADD. For that reason, you know, how many times we see deaths of adolescent children that, you know, are reaching for their text while they're calling somebody on their phone. It happens every day in our society, every single day. And that is an example of dysfunctional attention deficit disorder. But where are we now, right? So we're, we're in a situation in our society where everything is, everything is medicalized, right? And this is, you know, I'm guilty of this. Uh, you know, this is actually should be a joke that makes you laugh, but it's, it's also kind of sad. And this is an old cartoon that I would, there's, there's probably about 25 other drugs under each age category that we would have to add. Okay, let's talk about dopamine. So dopamine is my favorite neurotransmitter. I would call it the Woody Allen of neurotransmitters, right? Like, you know, Woody Allen once said that uh, the brain was his second favorite organ. And I've always got people to say to me, you know, well, what, what, what's his first favorite organ? Well, if you want to understand the connection between the brain and that second organ, understand dopamine. So dopamine, dopamine is, is enriched throughout our brains, uh, and it, it has three primary functions depending on its location. So the first location is its effects in the prefrontal cortex. And Dr. Howell talked about the brakes, like he's a brake specialist. The frontal cortex are the human brain's brakes. Okay, when we stop uh, from having an impulse, the reason that we're able to do that is our frontal lobes override our limbic system. So if we're attracted to the opposite sex, but you know, it's not an appropriate setting, yada, 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 the frontal lobes, through dopamine, provide the brake fluid to prevent that behavior from occurring. That's where we think most of the circuitry of ADD actually is probably impaired, either genetically, biologically, uh, physiologically. It's, it's called a, a, a mesocortical pathway, for those of you that are more into the science. The other two pathways are, one's in the basal ganglia, which is deeper in the brain, and you may know of a disease called Parkinson's disease that's related to dopamine deficiency in that disorder. So the, the basal ganglia's primary effect is movement and coordination. And by, by, that's why you see a lot of Tourette's and tics in children with ADD for that exact reason. There's a dopamine imbalance between the basal ganglia and the, and the prefrontal cortex. And then the third is the brainstem. And the brainstem uh, is coupled to another brain chemical called norepinephrine. It's also adrenaline, for lack of a better word. You can't pay attention if you're not awake. So I hate to say it, some of you are kind of nodding off already. You know, if, uh, you're gonna need more adrenaline. And I could easily increase your adrenaline, but then you'd be mad at me. So I'm gonna let you sleep, if those of you that are napping right now. But that's, that's the, the first thing that gets aroused, right? So if you think about the hierarchy of, of learning, the first is you have to be awake. Be awake. And as, as, as doctors taking care of patients, I will tell you that most, if not uh, a significant majority, of your children and your adolescents particularly, they're not awake. They're not awake. Why they're not awake? Because we make them to go to school at six o'clock. My daughter gets up at six o'clock in the morning, every morning. This is not a normal circadian pattern for teens, right? They get up at six because she's got to put her makeup on, blah, blah, blah. She, you know, she gets to school at seven. 
uh, and she comes home at 2. Well, she, she comes home, she naps. She is so tired. So we're basically taking these kids and forcing them into a circadian pattern that makes no biological sense whatsoever, okay? And what do we do with these kids when they're not focusing? We call them ADD, and we give them stimulants to wake up their brain. It is just such an awful situation, and the reason that it is what it is is because drug companies make a lot of money on selling drugs for ADD. Let's be real, okay? Uh, and it's, it's pretty disturbing that, that we can't change a very simple thing in our society because of influences that won't allow us to do that. Okay, so again, dopamine actually provides us uh, with its, its overall integrative activity uh, is to essentially uh, um, converge your uh, emotional excitement with your intellectual excitement. Okay, so let me give you an example. If I told you right now that Dr. Greenblatt just raised the money for this lecture and he's got a million dollar check waiting for one person who's gonna answer a quiz at the end of this seminar. It's 100 questions, and you don't know what the questions are, but it's gonna be anything that we talk about in this lecture. So I guarantee you, your arousal levels would go up, you know, some of you look, not really. Okay, $5 million, okay? <laughs> really, let's, let's raise the ante here. But that's dopamine. So dopamine actually gives you that sort of emotional attachment to the event that you're experiencing. Think of 9-11, another example, right? How many of you remember 9-11? Exactly, right? Nobody doesn't remember 9-11, unless you're too young to remember it. The reason is that event had tremendous emotional significance to our society. That's a dopamine-coupled effect, all right? Think next week, if you ask, you know, who spoke at the New Hampshire lecture, uh, you know, what was this guy, Dr. Lombard? What are you talking about? You're like, who's Dr. Lombard? Like, you remember my name. Why? Because there's not as de the degree of emotional attachment to this lecture unless you're a parent that's here to learn about this for your child, right? So we take advantage of that. Pharmaceutically, what we do is we trick the brain. We give the brain drugs that, that essentially elevate dopamine. And when they elevate dopamine, the experience that you're having in a dopamine state is like how you felt on your first date, right? You kind of, oh, oh, you're beautiful. Oh, yeah, I'll give you flowers, you know? That's, that's a dopamine state, your, your high attention. So what happens in school-age kids? So they go to school, and they absolutely can't stand their teachers, okay? I hate any teachers in the room. <laughs> okay, you're one of the good guys then, because mo cause I hear, I go, I, I go to my daughter, do you like my teachers? I hate my teachers, why do you hate them? They're just, they're so boring, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so we have kids that don't like their teachers. And of course, it, you don't pay attention to things you don't like, who pays attention to things that they don't like? Raise your hand. Is anybody? You pay attention to things you don't like? You're not telling the truth. Okay. So what do we do? We trick the brain. We give it, we give it Adderall. We give it Vyvanse. We give it Ritalin. We raise the brain dopamine, right? And then the kid goes to school the next day and goes, wow, trigonometry is so cool. I mean, it's like, you know, I really, I could see, like, my career being trigonometry all of a sudden, okay? We trick the brain into making believe that that, that, met, that lesson, educationally, has relevance for the brain. Or we didn't trick it, and it actually does have relevance for the brain, right? <laughs> so, anyway. Some of these slides I'm going to skip, but just to, if those of you that are interested in biochemistry, the way that these drugs work is actually very simple. This is a presynaptic neuron, this is a postsynaptic neuron. These are what are called shuttle buses, okay? They're like uh, ways of actually increasing the, the transportation of brain chemicals like dopamine from one area of the brain to another area. For, you know, this is called a synapse, okay? And this DAT stands for a dopamine transporter, okay? And it takes the dopamine, these are the, the dopamine chemicals, these green, you know, artistic, rendering of what dopamine looks like. And the way that dopamine uh, terminates is by going back to the presynaptic neuron through this transporter, okay? So if you want to increase your synaptic dopamine, what do you do? You basically cut off this, this protein. That's what these drugs do. They, they essentially block this protein. It's called the dopamine transport protein 
drugs, any drug, Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, they all do the same thing. They essentially block this reuptake mechanism that neutralizes dopamine and leaves more in the synapse. That's how you increase brain dopamine. Now, why is this important for us as nutritionists or people who believe in non-pharmacological therapies believe that this important mechanism to understand is that there are ways nutritionally that are impacted both negatively and positively on these transport proteins. Okay, so some of these are, are natural compounds. Uh, one of them is a dietary supplement called methylfolic acid or methylfolate. Methylfolate as, acts as a cofactor to increase the neurotransmissions uh, by literally acting as a fertilizer for, for brain chemistry. So all of our neurotransmitters come from amino acids. Every, every brain uh, chemical comes from amino acids. GABA is an amino acid. Dopamine comes from an amino acid called tyrosine. You guys heard that, but am I going, is this too detailed? I don't know. Jim, where's Jim? No? This is okay? All right. So tyrosine is, a, is, a, is a, an amino acid that ultimately gets converted to dopamine. And it goes through a series of enzymatic steps uh, that actually, it goes from like boot camp to being a Navy SEAL, right? So the nor dopamine is the, the Navy SEAL, tyrosine is the boot camp. And the way that the boot camp uh, uh, promotes its production is through a variety of vitamins and, sup and supplements, the main one principally being iron, iron, uh, and the second is, is folic acid. Now why is iron important? Iron actually is a cofactor uh, for, for many dopamine-related pathways. And clinically, we know that there's another condition that is comorbid with ADD called restless leg syndrome. So another thing of your history to ask about in terms of sleep issues is, you know, do you kick a lot at night? You know, and sometimes they won't even be aware of it unless they sleep with somebody else. Oh my God, my, my wife or husband was like just, you know, whoops, sorry, you know, there you go. Because I actually do do this in my sleep as well. Um, but there's actually a strong relationship of restless leg syndrome with iron deficiency. Um, and there's even some data showing that iron deficient children have ADD symptoms. So a very simple thing to tell your pediatricians, right? It's not, you're not gonna pick it up in every child with ADHD, but in a fair number of, of children, you may find medically, nutritionally reversible causes for ADD by just asking the question, right? Is, is my child iron deficient? Um, there's also another blood test called ferritin that is even more sensitive for iron deficiency, if you're interested in that. that. Okay, then the other neurotransmitter is, is norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is, is this arousal uh, chemical that comes from the brainstem and literally like turns the circuitry on. So dopamine and norepinephrine work together. And in fact, most of the drugs that are for ADD work in concert by, use, by blocking both dopamine and norepinephrine. So two chemicals instead of one. Certain drugs only block norepinephrine. And for a free dinner on uh, Dr. Greenblatt tonight, but you can't answer the question, is there any ADD drug that selectively affects norepinephrine and not dopamine? Stratera. Very good. You must be a physician. Psycho Very good that you know that. So Stratera. Stratera is a drug that's a non-stimulant for ADD. Problem is it doesn't work really well at all for most kids. Uh, another problem with it is that it's metabolized by uh, the liver, and I'll explain to you how liver metabolism affects these drugs. Okay, so we talked about this already, uh, how dopamine uh, enhances the signal by increasing your sort of likability of an event. That's what improves attention. And norepinephrine helps to sort of dampen the noise around it and to kind of stimulate the brain to pay attention. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people develop ADD, right? Uh, and there's also, you know, again, a threshold about who needs to be treated based upon their dysfunctionality. It really is, when I, when I would see patients in practice, I'm not in practice as much as I used to be, but I would ask, you know, the family or the children, is how dysfunctional or impaired do you feel with this condition? So in my case, you know, I don't feel, I mean, I feel impaired when I lose something, but like what Dr. Howell said, I, to me, ADD 
makes me more creative. I mean, that's just the, the, the flip side of, of having this problem is that you know, 80 children and adults are extremely curious. That's why they get bored so easily. So I, I don't like uh, or feel I need medication. Now, probably people in my life would, would strongly disagree with that assessment. Uh, but uh, the reality is that there's genetic components to this. And my mom had ADD, right? I, I mean, I remember looking back and how her pocketbook was just like this scattered mess of things, you know? It's like, Mom, do you have the receipt for that, for that thing you just bought? Like, you know, looking at things. And that's me. I'm exactly the same way. So she gave it to me, damn it. My mom gave me these genes. My dad did not have ADD. He had other problems, he, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> but they're both gone, so. So it, it is, it is it, in fact, ADD is the most familial of psychiatric diseases, okay, which is very surprising. Schizophrenia, uh, you know, uh, depression, alcoholism. ADD has the strongest genetic link. Uh, so that's been shown in a number of different studies. Here are the questions. What are some of the genes for ADD? Uh, oops, let me go back. Um, it is true there's no genetic test. If someone comes out tomorrow and says, we have a genetic test for ADD to diagnose it, they're, they're, it's their phony baloney, OK? Uh, it's, it's too complex a disorder biologically to pinpoint on one particular circuit of the brain. However, there, these genes have been associated in what's called GWAS studies. GWAS takes thousands of people with a diagnosis. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. What genes do they have that the people who don't have ADHD uh, exhibit? And these are some of the genes that they've uh, found. So the dopamine transporter. Just, let's see how you, what does dopamine transporter do? Let's see how this group's doing over here. What's the function of dopamine transporter? Transports dopamine, right? That's very good. <laughs> Smart Alec, right? OK, so yes, it transports dopamine. So by people who have a defect in that transportation process are going to have problems with their dopamine balance, right? Um, COMPT is an important enzyme I'm going to talk to you about as well. Uh, another, con another medical condition besides iron or B12 or folic acid deficiency is subclinical hypothyroidism, OK? And in, in children, you may also see growth hormone deficiency in these children. So they're going to present with uh, ADD symptoms, but also growth hormone problems. In fact, one of the side effects of stimulants is that it suppresses growth hormone. So there's a concern if you have a, a child with short stature that has ADD, and you've read the literature and you say, hey, doc, you know, this may actually blunt my child's growth further. They may come, oh, no, it's not been proven. But it's fairly strong. The link is fairly strong. The question is we don't know if that link is due to the underlying biology of ADD itself or due to the medication. Uh, my feeling is it's due to the biology of the condition itself, that the pituitary gland uh, is having problems raising certain hormones and chemicals, including thyroid. So it's an important caveat if you're in the practice of doing labs to check for thyroid dysfunction as well. OK. And in many ways, hypothyroidism is a, is a hidden disease. Uh, and that's a whole separate lecture. I'm not going to go into that. Um, we talked about this already. OK, so what about this enzyme? So COMPT is an abbreviation for an enzyme that exists in the prefrontal cortex. Which, which area of the brain is the brake pads? Let's see your retention. The prefrontal cortex. And what's the liquid that brake pads use to Dopamine, right. So the goal in ADHD pharmacologically is to increase the brake fluid because the brake pads have less inhibition. Less inhibition means more impulse control problems, right? So we're looking at catecholomethyltransferase is the enzyme that regulates the, the fluid of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. And it does that by essentially breaking down dopamine. It is there to break it down because you don't want it hanging around. You've got to change your oil every 5,000 miles. Except if you have ADD and you wait till 20,000 miles and your car is like smoking, right? Never happened to me. Just once it happened. OK. Um, anyway, so, so COMPT actually uh, breaks down dopamine. And that's under genetic control. So we know that people uh, have what's called the warrior versus the warrior distribution of temperaments. And there are people who are warriors, and that's not meant necessarily in the best way, but it means that they are more likely to be risk takers. Um, and those people have lower 
dopamine in their prefrontal cortex. And we know that through a variety of different types of tests, including looking at the COMPT activity. So these patients, not, they're not patients, they're regular people. They have high enzymatic activity of this enzyme, and they're more likely to take risks because they have lower prefrontal <laughs> dopamine. OK, bless you. The flip side are the worriers, right? And the worriers are people that have high dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. And because of that, they're more likely to inhibit themselves from taking risk. You know, hey, why don't we go skydiving tomorrow? Skydiving? Let me research how many people actually have died from skydiving before we go. OK, uh, did you do that risk yet? Let's, let's do some more research on that skydiving risk. So those are the worriers. And they're the worriers because they have more good inhibitory uh, mechanisms in their brains. The problem is that both groups can present with ADD for different reasons, right? So the, 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 uh, the, the, the warriors are the ones that, that like are the Navy SEALs, right? They're, they're, they're scattered. Uh, they're high adrenaline junkies. They like taking risk. Uh, but that has bad consequences, like getting killed, right? It's not like, you know, such a great idea to, to join the Navy SEALs. Um, so those are the people that we think biochemically would respond to more dopamine, either pharmaceutically or non-pharmaceutically. And there are ways actually of increasing dopamine non-pharmaceutically. Uh, but again, this is a pathway. It's not, we're not talking about a particular drug. Okay, so higher COMPT leads to lower dopamine and it's associated with changes in cognition. And just to show you that this is a bell-shaped curve, we're all somewhere in this bell-shaped curve, right? So some of us are on this extreme, uh, others are on this extreme, but the point is that we know preferentially that we can predict with some certainty that people who have low dopamine would respond to what better? Stimulants, right? Stimulants raise dopamine, so if you have genetic markers that suggest that you have low dopamine from enzyme processes, you may respond better to a stimulant than a person who has high dopamine. In fact, there's been data that the high dopamine individuals, the COMPT METs, METs of the world, have higher rates of PTSD. It's very interesting. So in fact, not only are they not forgetting a traumatic event, they're reliving that traumatic event over and over, and experiencing the physiology of the trauma along with the psychology of the trauma. And that gives us some information about how we, how we treat those patients as well. All right, lower dopamine, right? Lower than norepinephrine levels. So simple. And uh, it's, it's, it's sad that, that we as psychiatrists and neurologists don't understand how simple this biology actually is. And the reason it says that we have a very rich portfolio of medications that are not FDA approved for PTSD that we could use if we only understood that biology. So for instance, there are medications that treat blood pressure that work by lowering norepinephrine. And they're very effective for PTSD symptoms. Why does no one know about that? Because there's no patent on it. There's no drug company with, with the good looking reps that know how to get the dopamine and the doctor to pay attention to write their latest Lexapro drug. It's, it's really, it's unfortunate because we can treat PTSD much better than we do right now. Okay, so. So one of the basic things here, and this is so simple, it is absolutely so simple that I can't believe that we as physicians don't pay attention to this, right? So I work with a neuroradiologist at Mount Sinai, best neuroradiologist I've ever met um, because he's really a patient-centric radiologist, which is an oxymoron, right? How many radiologists are, are patient-centric? It's like the biggest joke in the world. But so we, we were talking, and I'll give you his name later if you're interested, but he's, he's at Sinai in New York. And he was saying that they used to do studies on blood flow, uh, just they could assess blood flow in different people's ages. And the, the changes in blood flow between a child and an adult are magnitude differences. Magnitude, like not like 5%, 10%, like four or five times higher blood flow than an adult, right? So what does that tell us? A, children have open minds. Think about it, right? They literally have higher perfusion of their brains that blood flow is enriching uh, all the, the chemistry of their brain. And you know, why would we not understand this and, and leverage this for improving children's brain's health? Because it's a very simple way of, of improving cerebral blood flow. It's called exercise, right? Very, very simple. 
It's the only thing that treats my ADD. I, I, if I don't exercise, I, I, I won't even be able to, to create companies like Genomind. Um, so the imaging, someone asked about imaging and ADHD. There was a question at the, at the earlier break uh, about ADHD imaging. And just to tell you that, uh, you know, SPECT studies, uh, which Dr. Amon's been, you know, strongly associated with the research on SPECT studies in, in ADD, SPECT is a, is a very, um, someone referred to it as a CAT scan. It's not a CAT scan. SPECT is a totally different technology, by the way. But, but SPECT measures blood flow, okay? And it's a very sensitive test uh, for blood flow, but it's not a specific test. So that there's a lot of sort of downsides to using SPECT scan for, for brain imaging. It's not a bad study, but there are much better imaging modalities that are developed uh, that are sort of not in clinical use right now, people should know about. Okay, one of those is, is looking at, at, at PET scan and what are called D2 receptors. So these are dopamine receptors that light up when you experience that Woody Allen sensation, right? When you have uh, an excitement for some reason, either organically or exogenously, these areas in the basal ganglia light up, right? That's all dopamine excitation right there on those slides. And we know that cocaine, if you store cocaine, you're gonna get a nice big hit of dopamine. If you do methamphetamine, God, I was walking downtown. This is a bad town. I mean, there's, there's a, you know, I hate whoever, sorry guys, but it's true. I mean, I was walking down the street and there were like all these, you know, methamphetamine junkies walking around. It's like, oh, this is, this is bad. But that's what it does to the brain. In fact, I've had methamphetamine patients tell me that they were addicted after one dose. That the, the feeling of euphoria that they experienced from one dose of methamphetamine was enough to make them addicts. The same thing with crack, crack, I've heard that from crack cocaine patients as well. But alcohol also does this, right? That's the good old fashioned way of increasing dopamine. Uh, and of course we have fast foods. Uh, you know, this is the, the whole fast food industry is based on a working knowledge that these foods are addicting. They are addicting, okay? Salt, sugar are, are drugs of abuse. They're drugs. They're drugs. I mean, I, the, the fact that we don't regulate sugar and salt are, are, as drugs makes no sense whatsoever. Sugar is a toxin for the brain. Toxin, especially for elderly people. I mean, you just, if, you, if you're worried about cognition, don't spend a million dollars on, on getting your work up right away. Just eliminate all simple sugar. Not complex sugar, but, but simple sugars. Okay, but anyway, these are some studies looking at uh, ADHD uh, on functional MRI scans. Not really, I think, to go into detail for this lecture today because, you know, this is fairly technical and is really for people that spend their lives researching these things. Um, but another study is called fMRI. This was done by McLean, by the way. We have a McLean psychiatrist here. Uh, this study was done at McLean that, that actually looked at uh, differences in this basal ganglia uh, through MRI scans. And you can actually see differences uh, on MRI uh, related to the perfusion of the brain in those areas of the brain. So particularly, it's an area of the brain called the putamen. It's not that important for most of you to understand, but it's part of that sort of club of, of hedonistic, non-hedonistic uh, socialization neurons that decide on whether someone should do something that's pleasurable or not. That's kind of where these circuitries go. Uh, and clearly showing changes in the perfusion uh, in ADHD children and adults, meaning that, that they're not getting the right nutrients to the area of the brain. Okay, so what do you do? So first of all, first thing when you have a, a child or an adult with ADHD, ask about their sleep, okay? Just ask about the sleep patterns. I almost guarantee you at least 60% of your uh, patients with ADHD will have some sleep disorder. Uh, always rule out mood disorders. These are comorbid conditions. Uh, in psychiatry, you can see a lot of uh, bipolar uh, types of symptoms, and sometimes psychiatrists are very confused whether the behavioral disturbance is due to ADHD uh, or uh, a mood disorder, and what do they do? They cover their bases and, and medicate for both, which to me is also counter insanely unintuitive. Right, so we don't know if it's ADHD or bipolar, let's just treat him for both and see if he gets better. This is what, this is what happens in, in psychiatry. 
Uh, seizure disorders are not common cause of ADHD symptoms, but there's something called absence seizures. A child will stare into space for about 15 to 30 seconds. They can do that 60 to 80 times a day. Teacher says, hey, you know what? Uh, your, your son is not paying attention in school. He's always zoning out. Well, yeah, he has absence seizures, thank you very much. So, and then Dr. Howell mentioned dyslexia, very important comorbid condition with ADHD. And again, ask about these domains of impairment. So, you know, is there substance abuse history? Is there criminality? Uh, what's their sexual behavior like? We know that teenagers, uh, girls with ADHD, are more likely to get pregnant. Obvious reasons, they don't use birth control. Or they don't think about their activity before they have it. Okay, and ADHD is a lifelong problem. Post a child right here, I can tell you again that most of us don't grow out of it. It changes, but it's the same temperament. So I, my temperament is exactly the same now as it was, unfortunately, as it was when I was like, you know, 10 or 11 years old. And uh, those that work with me know that I'm a very impetuous person, right? So if I, if I, I'll just say what's on my mind, not think of the consequences. I once met uh, um, Bill Clinton uh, in a personal like meeting, and I go, Dude, I love what you did for the country. He's like, you know, I'm the president of the United States. You know, I was like, seriously. Because he didn't react well when I told him. I, I thought he would. I don't know why. I have that impression. <laughs> um, okay, so these are some of the core symptoms they're going to, and again, Dr. Howell is exactly right. Forget these checklists. Do a history. Ask these questions. Are you easily distracted? Do you have excess movement during sleep? Are you very impatient? No, not me. Are you disorganized? No, not me. Are you easily bored? No, not me. Can't complete tasks? I don't know. Ask my company about that. Uh, history of substance abuse? No, but caffeine, about seven cups a day. Oh, there it is, excessive caffeine consumption. Here we go. Okay, feel overwhelmed and performs worse under pressure. Now, that's subjective, right? Some people do better, some do worse. Uh, Short-fused. Uh, sometimes, yes. Lack of attention to details, definitely. Poor listening skills, I'm working really hard on that one. Okay, I am. Restless and fidgety, yeah. History of school performance, so I, I would definitely get diagnosed here. Okay, um, and again, think of all these other things that go along with it, right? So someone asked about autism, ADD, uh, dyslexia, and, and the like. Uh, we did these already. In very young children, by the way, always think of otitis media and hearing deficits. And lead, lead exposure is a, is a very missed problem. They, we still have lead toxicity problems, guys. Uh, in you know, Michigan, I'm sure you guys follow the story. I mean, we po I don't think people realize what we did. We poisoned a generation of, of low socioeconomic children that's gonna, unless they're treated properly, is gonna have consequences for the rest of their lives. And we saw, oh, it was a great story for a couple of weeks because we have collective ADD. But lead is really bad for the brain. There's actually theories that the Roman Empire uh, dissolved because they had excess uh, um, exposure to copper and lead because they, they were really into these, you know, the Cartesian wells and all that stuff like that, that they actually, their brains collectively became, you know, rusted as a result of, of metal exposure. And there are a lot of people in the alternative medical community that believe that this is true for our brains as well. That, and I, I'm becoming more of a believer in that as I get older, uh, that we have problems with metal biology. And there's lots of research to substantiate that as well. Okay, substance abuse, addictive behavior, uh, anhedonia, right? So that's where the Woody Allen movie comes from, you know, Annie Hall because he had, you know, anhedonia, right? Okay, so what do we do nat naturally? So we can actually increase our dopamine by preloading with an amino acid called tyrosine, right? Tyrosine is that boot camp, you know, pre-Navy SEAL guy, right? And if you give more tyrosine and a higher protein diet uh, and, a, and, a, and you reduce your simple carbs, uh, you will increase your brain dopamine. Carbs increase serotonin, and so there's, a, there's a neurochemical reason why that if you really want me to explain to you, I will after the break, but definitely not for the main audience. 
but high protein increases the amount of dopamine production in the brain. Very simple. Yeah, so people who are obese you know, can lose 20, 30 pounds on a diet like this and increase their, their brain dopamine levels, especially if you include physical exercise with it. Um, cortisol is, a, is, is really a downer, right? So you want to check cortisol levels in your patients. Check for iron deficiency. We mentioned that before. Uh, there are natural things that increase dopamine that don't cost a lot of money, um, OK? And I'm actually going to show you something I really like. And I'm not a paid speaker for these guys, but it's a, it's a product called Viarin. Have you guys seen this? So Viarin is uh, a combination of, of two uh, dietary supplements. One is called phosphatidylserine, and the other is called DHA. DHA. Um, DHA you've probably heard of, but, but PS you haven't heard of, right? Or, or have you? You've heard of it? What's that? From us guys. Who's us guys? <laughs> Gina mentioned this? That's good. OK. All right, anyone want to know what, what they are, what they do? OK, let me see if I have uh, some stuff on that. So, so they're both lipid-based molecules. Our brains are fatty substances. Okay, most of our brain is fat. If you take the water out of the brain, like 80% of the brain is, is literally fat. There's a reason that our brains are fatty, okay? And that is because fat in, in, uh, improves conduction of myelin. It helps signals in the brain work better. Phosphatidylserine uh, is a natural lipid uh, that actually is embedded in brain cell membranes. And that ability to be embedded in the cell membrane increases what's called uh, plasticity. Have you, heard, have you heard that term before? So plasticity means the ability to change, to modify. Uh, if your fat is really uh, dense, like, like you ever let fat sit out for a day and it becomes like, you know, like pudding, okay? People's brains literally could look like that with high saturated fat. They develop very, very rigid fat in their synapses, in their membranes. And as a result of that, they have reduced synaptic neurotransmission, reduced plasticity. The flip of that is very liquid, very porous brains, right? Because the lipid is still viscous. That's what this compound does. It increases the viscosity of, of brain lipids so that they have the ability to enhance their plasticity. Does that make sense? OK. Yeah, so, well, they, they, I mean, you could get this separately or through this product. And again, I, get, I don't even know who these people are, but I picked this up, seriously. So it's called Viarin, okay? And it's a natural product uh, that contains DHA and phosphatidylserine in it. Um, how do you spell this? They're, they're, they're going to be, just go outside. They'll, they'll tell you everything, trust me. You know, don't worry, they'll find you, okay? Um, okay. Another, by the way, you know, we should really thank uh, um, Dr. Greenblatt for this lecture, but also for this particular slide. Uh, Jim wrote a book on, on lithium uh, and how lithium in our, in our diet has been depleted. And as a result of that, we see higher levels of aggression in society. So lithium is not only a drug. It also is considered by some to be an essential nutrient. Lithium is just like potassium, right? It's found in, in, in our food supply. And it's amazing there's been studies that show that there's higher rates of aggression, higher rates of suicide and homicide in societies where the lithium levels in the soil are depleted, like in the Middle East. I mean, it's really freaky if you think that how much an effect of a micronutrient can have on behavior. Uh, so there are people actually who use lithium uh, as, a, as, a, as a nutraceutical, not as a drug, but very, very low doses of lithium. And Jim, I, you can probably talk about that later, correct? OK, good. OK. So again, we want to increase blood flow to children, right? Uh, our technologies have become electronic cages, right? Dr. Howell talked about this as well. You know, this picture is, you know, I hope I got permission from these two kids. I don't think I did. <laughs> I don't even know who those two kids are, so. But, it's a, it, but you know, it's, think about how we constrain kids, right? When I was a kid, 
you know, growing up in like uh, Long Island, I'd run around and come home at 10 o'clock at night, you know, playing Ring Alivio till I was like, you know, pff, flat out. And now, like, you know, well, you have to have a play date and you have to have like five people security guards watching you. <laughs> Retired Navy SEALs, even better if we can afford it, right? Um, and this is what the harm that that does to our kids developing. Kids need to experience an open world. Okay, other supplements that are, that are good for ADHD, theocrine. Theocrine is a alkaloid that comes from the, 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 the coffee bean plant. So coffee has caffeine, which is why we love coffee so much. Uh, but theocrine is another compound in, in the coffee bean that actually increases wakefulness. Okay, and I've, I've used it on a number of my patients and they really like it. Uh, don't ask where to get it, I don't make it myself. Uh, I'm not a rep for theocrine, but I can almost guarantee you that when I give these lectures, within a year, one of the companies out there will have a theocrine for ADHD product. And they won't even say, they, they, they won't even acknowledge that they saw this slide at this meeting, but so it goes. Um, ascorbic acid and dopamine, okay? This is a very important nutrient uh, particularly because ascorbic acid balances iron levels uh, in the brain as well. So iron, for those of you that are into neurochemistry a little bit, iron could either be a foe or a friend. It's either a free radical or a, or a Navy SEAL. I mean, that's how different iron can perform in the brain. And ascorbic acid ensures that iron stays in its safe state, that it doesn't become a free radical. Uh, someone asked earlier at DHA, so how does DHA and phosphatidylserine or Viarin actually improve dopamine? It improves the receptive uh, functionality of that neurotransmitter on the receptor. So when a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor, it has to commune with it, right? It's like having sex, like you, what am I doing wrong? This guy's coming after me. How, <laughs> how much time do I have left? Keep going? I end until you pull me off the stage? <laughs> Six minutes? Seven minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so again, that, that's what dopamine uh, uh, is improved by these compounds. Okay, and everyone asks about fatty acids. The reality is that omega-3 fatty acids are good for you, but don't think that you can, you know, substitute, you know, medical treatment just by using omega-3 fatty acids for ADHD. Uh, I can tell you clinically, I've not seen them be that effective in isolation. I think you can use them with other compounds if you're not going to do pharmaceutical therapies. But, but supplements by themselves, and particularly the fish oils, have, have been tested in several randomized studies. Uh, and the meta-analyses, you know, it's not better than placebo. However, some of the, 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 the smaller points of those studies showed that there's less aggression, less depression, and less hostility, which is also very common in ADHD children and adults, right? So comorbid irritability, aggression, depression, those things got better, but the core symptoms of ADHD, the attentional problems, did not get better. Okay, there's also zinc deficiency. Again, uh, Jim will talk more about zinc deficiency, but these are the kids you should think about that have comorbid growth delay uh, and growth hormone failure with ADHD. So they have slower bone growth, uh, they're short, uh, and in in elderly people, and by the way, I, could, I should ask this question here because, you know, some of us are, are getting to the point where we may have reduced sense of smell and taste. So how many of you actually notice that in yourselves? That you're the only honest person in the room, I think. Okay, it's, it's benign, okay? How many of you have had it? It's benign. Still you're not going to admit? You're not even aware that your sense of taste or smell is diminished? It has, it, even if you're not aware of it. My, my, my... 12-year-old daughter, like I, I smoke cigars like once every six months and I have to like take showers and because if I come home, she, she smells it. So I smoked a cigar like three, on a business trip like five days before I got home. I walk in the door, so he goes, <laughs> Daddy, you smoked that cigar again, didn't you? She goes, it's gonna kill you, you're gonna get cancer. I go, I'm not gonna get cancer from one cigar. She goes, don't, why don't lie to me? It's, it's very sweet, actually, that she cares that much about it. And when I think about it, like, I want to smoke some damn cigars, you know? But my point is that her sense of smell is so acute that she was able to smell that cigar, like, after three days, it's already out of my system. As we get older, we lose our sense of taste and our sense of smell. 
and that is primarily a sign of zinc deficiency. So if you want to actually improve someone's taste or their smell, it's not, it's not always a home run, but it's a, it's a good little secret, you know, kind of curbside recommendation. Zinc's been looked at as an antidepressant, uh, probably because it increases dopamine. So zinc is one of the cofactors, along with iron and folic acid, that actually raises brain uh, dopamine levels. It does it, anyone want to guess on, on its mechanism of how we think that it raises dopamine for a free dinner on Dr. Greenblatt? <laughs> it actually messes with a transporter protein. It actually it knocks down the transporter protein to a level that leaves more synaptic dopamine in the synaptic cleft. Okay, ferritin, that's with iron. Uh, okay, so any, any questions about this at all? Any, any questions?